All right. Hello, everybody. Sorry it took so long to get started. Um, had a little bit of trouble getting my slides up so I could share them. All right, so we'll get started. Jamie is leaving the office. I'll wait for her to leave. <laughs> it's that time when everybody's grabbing their lunch and getting to the next office and so on. So it's a busy time. So, all right, let's look at uh, today. We're I'm going to introduce myself. I'm not sure. We might have some new people on here. I'm Jill Slavin. I'm the uh, registered nurse here at Valley Professionals. I'm a diabetic educator, um, a certified diabetic educator. I've been educating since 20. 15, but got certified in 2018. Um, and so since then have learned a whole lot more. And we used to do the diabetic groups, you know, in person, but because um, of COVID, we went to virtual. And so we're, we're still working on that. We're not sure which way we're going to go back to either doing it in person or continue with virtual. So we'll be meeting with marketing to see what the plan is for next year. But um, we've done a lot this year so far. Last month, we had Dr. Rico with us, which was really cool to have a board certified endocrinologist available to um, tell us more about the different medications. And, and we learned a lot that time. And then um, we got um, October coming up, where we're going to talk more about going back to the store with some new recipes that hopefully are affordable. Um, I say hopefully because things have changed with cost of food, but we're going to work on making sure they're affordable and um, healthy for you. And then November, we're going to talk about surviving the holidays. And then, of course, Christmas. I think the plan was um, we're going to talk more about Bright Spots and Landmines, which is an actual book by Adam Brown. And, um, you know, we're going to talk more about what he says in there about managing diabetes. So we'll end the year with that. Uh, and then we look forward to a new year. So this time, though, we're going to talk about supplements. And my question to you, and to encourage you to start using or participating more, if you would, um, and I tried to set it up so I could do something to where I could do a quiz and we could see the results online and I couldn't get it all to work. So um, I have to do it the old fashioned way where if you would just send in a message to us right now, everybody participate by putting in yes or no. Do you believe supplements are safe and effective? And just a yes or no um, answer to that, really. Or if you want to add anything else with your experience, please do that. Um, I'll give everybody a few minutes to respond to that question. But just as a review, as you're th thinking about that, you know, we I would have liked to have reviewed all the different supplements and, and different formulas and things that are out there that people say help with diabetes, but there just wasn't enough time. This is a list of a few that were on some of the research that I looked at. But again, this is just a small portion, I think, of what's actually out there. So I would have liked to have removed, reviewed a lot more, but I just didn't have the time and we're not going to have the time either today to go over uh, everything. So I pulled out, uh, I think, eight different um, supplements. And just as a reminder, especially as we're getting taught before we get started, we're talking about supplements because I don't feel real strong in that area as far as knowledgeable, I guess. Um, the resources that I used, I added to the slides and I tried to put them on the individual slides. Uh, I'm sure they're not all written correctly in the APA citation format. Um, I apologize for that. <laughs> I gave enough information, hopefully, so that if you um, want to look it up and do some more research on your own, that resource can be found on the resource page. I'm going to say this a lot during the presentation. I would suggest that you always talk to your healthcare provider um, to determine which supplements are safe for you. I just think that um, as we go through this, I think that you're going to find that, you know, some are considered maybe kind of safe, possibly safe, and others are going to say, please avoid, and maybe you've been taking them. So um, we're going to talk about doses that are usually recommended, some of the negative side effects um, that can happen, and we're going to actually use some critical thinking skills um, to, 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 to look at supplements. I really want us to start being more critical thinkers, I guess, about it so that, uh, individually that you would all be able to do this on your own at some point at the very end of the slide. And I think, uh, Haley will add it also as a, a, a handout at some point in the presentation, you'll be able to get to, there's a, um, a resource that kind of puts all of the different, not all, but most of the um, supplements that are out there, it puts them on one page and it kind of, it gives you an indication and color of how um, safe they are and how much like um, the Cleveland Clinic would suggest that you take certain supplements. And we're going to look at that at the end also, but that will also be 
attached at some point so that you can actually um, look at that yourself and have that as a resource. So just looking at so what some people think uh, about supplements, uh, a lot of people, someone saying yes for fiber and good gut health. Um, yes, but as long as they're approved and don't interact with other medications. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I think that supplements have a lot of pros and cons. It should be discussion with your provider. Um, yeah, Dr. Gundry um, supplements have been improved the health of, a, of one of the participants. And one person says depends, too many variables. So yes and no. So I, I'm kind of glad to hear what all you guys said, because I was a little concerned that you might all be kind of frustrated at the very end of this when it gets to the point where we're like, well, we need to do more research <laughs> is what they usually end up saying at the end of the presentation or at the end of the research. Pro uh, anytime you've read research at the end, it always says, and more research is needed. And I think that's what we're going to kind of find at the end of this presentation also, but hopefully some information along the way. Um, so I think I'd really like for us to kind of try to do our own research and become more uh, knowledgeable and critical thinkers when it comes to supplements. So uh, let's look at this first. So I started thinking, well, what's critical thinking? And these in the box are kind of my thoughts, but then I looked up some definitions. So critical thinking is always, to me, a healthy questioning of any information. Um, it's, it's looking at research by comparing multiple resources, uh, maybe from those who have degrees or are experienced or specialists in the area, or even just people who um, related to the people who know something about the topic um, from experience. Uh, and then um, consider how is the information right for you personally is another way of thinking critically. So then I looked at specific definitions, and um, one of them was reason, consideration to evidence, context, methods, and criteria. So I like that one, like reasoned consideration. We're not just going to just make choose something for because you know our friend said so or a commercial said it was good for me. You're going to use some reasoning, and you're going to look at these things critically. Um, so let's dive in as we look at each. I only got to choose eight of the supplements, but let's look at... Uh, Let's look at these and think critically along the way. So cinnamon, specifically cashia cinnamon, and I put the pronunciation because I'm like, how do you spell that? I was pronouncing it wrong until I looked it up for the phonetic pronunciation there is cashia cinnamon specifically uh, is sold in stores um, or the ones that are, the cinnamon that's sold in stores may contain uh, multiple types of cinnamon, but the different types of cinnamon that are in other stores or in other countries in the United States most of our cinnamon is cashia cinnamon. So um, that's something you might want to look at as you're purchasing cinnamon as a spice to, to put on your apple cobbler or uh, your oatmeal in the morning. Um, but the thing that most of, this is the number one spice, the number one supplement that my patients ask me about is cinnamon. Uh, how, and, and the question really is how much cinnamon should they eat to actually have an effect on their blood sugar? And so we were never for sure, you know, is it, is, is it a bunch or is it very little? And then, you know, thinking about how would you add that amount to your daily intake? Um, uh, we all, we always understood it had to be powdered cinnamon. You know, that's what we had in our minds as we talked about it, as I met with patients, you know, something, like I said, that you would sprinkle on your cinnamon or on your uh, oatmeal in the morning. Um, in 2017, I was at a national conference though, and it was kind of interesting. They had cinnamon that was actually put into capsules and they were, uh, with the selling point that they knew exactly how much cinnamon you had to have to improve your blood sugar, such and such amount. Uh, the thing that I thought was that caught my eye that I thought was a little little bit fishy was the name of the met of the supplement was sensulin. So it was almost like they were working the word insulin in with cinnamon. And I'm thinking, are they trying to like trick people or, you know, why would you even play on that word to make people think, oh, I can take this instead of my insulin, or it has something to do with insulin. You know, it's just, I felt like that was a little fishy. So it's those little things. If a red flag goes up, you want to definitely double check or double think about it, I guess. Um, so the question is, does cinnamon really improve blood sugar? Well, as always, there's different people that say different things, um, but a recent meta-analysis analysis reported that whole cinnamon or extract, cinnamon lowers fasting blood sugar about 10 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and that's a, somebody that has some um, experience, we would say, um, from the, the resource there. Uh, another quote from the resource that I got all of this from was today's dietitian is steer clear, be extremely cautious. Um, we know using a small amount of in, or a small amount of cinnamon on your food as a spice is safe, but we don't know the effects of taking larger doses. 
like in capsule form every day for months or years, uh, we need more research. So of course that's what they say um, a lot is we need more research. So let's look at some of these things. Let's think critically about some of these um, comments made on cinema. And so what is a meta-analysis? If you think of a triangle and the different levels of research and which ones are best, meta-analysis is at the top and that's when they've taken multiple. And I mean a lot usually, as many studies as they can find that did research on you know, cinnamon and blood sugar and is there an effect. Um, and they hey, will- Jill, I can't hear you anymore. You can't hear me? No, if you wanted to check your- Yeah, it's still- uh... There you are. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, okay. yep, you're good. Okay. Uh, so a meta-analysis is an examination of data from a number of independent studies um, of the same subject in order to see overall trends, to see is it true of what the research is trying to find the answer to. Um, so um, when someone else does, all, does the research, they come to their own conclusions. And if you only read that one research article, then you might think that's the conclusion, that's the answer. Uh, however, when you look at multiple studies, you're going to get a lot more information. You're going to be looking at all kinds of studies that focused on is cinnamon good for blood sugar. And so a meta-analysis is a pretty good place to start when it comes to is this reliable research. Um, so if we look back at the previous slide, a meta-analysis meta showed what is fasting first, first what's blood, fasting blood sugar so we've talked about that before and most of you probably already know fasting blood sugar is that blood sugar usually that we think of you taking in the morning when you first wake up before you've eaten or even drink anything so we think of that usually as a fasting blood sugar and then what is 10 milligrams per deciliter well when you check your blood sugar whether it's with a finger stick or if you scan it or you have a dexcom you know a cgm um, the measurement that you're getting that we measure here in the United States, at least, is measured in milligrams per um, deciliter. So the 10 is the amount of um, benefit they're saying you would get because it would decrease um, blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, I think it said, didn't it? Let me look back. Yeah. Uh, lowers fasting blood sugar about 10 points is really what we would say. So. You think, okay, it's 10 points, you know, really worth it. Is that really going to be a benefit? Uh, so the person that wrote this put this into can, kind of into perspective. A patient with an A1C of eight would need to lower their blood sugar by 30 milligrams per deciliter on a consistent basis to reach a goal of 7.0, an A1C of 7.0. So, you know, you can't just do, just say, okay, well, I'm going to take this and I'll lower my fasting blood sugar by 10. To see an actual benefit, you're going to have to lower Again, if your A1C was eight, you'd have to get it um, 30 points to get it uh, on a consistent basis to get it to an A1C of seven. So it indicates the supplements might be considered as an added agent, but not necessarily relied on as the main diabetic medication that you would take. All right, so how does cinnamon work? There is a compound in the uh, cinnamon that I can't pronounce the <laughs> hydroxycalcholine or colkin calcone cone anyway stimulates insulin receptors improving insulin sensitivity um, so uh, it kind of has a metabolic which is a metabolic defect in a lot of patients who have type 2 diabetes we are we're just not sensitive to the insulin meaning our body our pancreas is releasing the insulin but our cells are not receptive to the insulin so and I know I've said this before, insulin is like the key that unlocks the cell that lets the sugar into the cell. And if you can't get this, the cell to unlock and allow, and I'm using these words loosely, these are words I use to help describe it. You can't get that cell to open up to the uh, insulin uh, so that the sugar get in, then the sugar stays in the blood and you have high blood sugar. Um, so cinnamon supposedly helps improve this sensitivity. It makes your cells more sensitive to insulin so that they listen to the insulin and they open up. A uh, recommended dose of cinnamon is, and this is again from another resource at the bottom they, um, that they offered a suggestion, it was 500 milligrams um, taken twice a day, or, and I thought this was interesting, it kind of, that relates to three to six grams of powdered, powdered cinnamon, about three fourths to 1.2 teaspoons. And I'm like, that's doable actually, to just get the whole form, get it through the, you know, by sprinkling it on food. Uh, there are some side effects of cinnamon. Um, uh, 
It can worsen uh, the coumarin that's uh, found in uh, cinnamon may worsen uh, liver damage. So you want to be careful if you uh, have any liver concern, any problems with your liver, any chronic liver disease, make sure that you don't overdo the cinnamon or take the supplement. Um, and then also, again, taking more of it can cause contact dermatitis or some kind of a, a, an outward reaction can happen if you take too much of the cinnamon. So again, I think we're always left with, um, you know, is it a good idea? Is it not a good idea? Well, if it's not strong enough to really make a huge change in your blood sugar, you know, I started thinking, when might cinnamon a supplement be uh, something to consider. And if you think about it before you're actually diagnosed with diabetes, or if your A1C isn't, you know, very high, um, you know, maybe it wouldn't hurt. And I think like they said all along and all the things I read, it's always best to try and get it through the food that you eat uh, by adding it as a spice instead of taking it in a, in a capsule form or, or, or concentrated. Um, so there is a benefit to some extent, but once blood sugar is very uncontrolled or uncontrolled, uh, it would be, it would take too much of the cinnamon probably to get it to be well controlled without having um, diabetic medication. So um, using it as an extra added thing, I think if I think of someone like who's pre-diabetic, who actually hasn't been diagnosed diabetic, maybe trying to work some cinnamon, more cinnamon into their meals might have a, some kind of a, a little bit of a benefit. So here is another supplement that I have a lot of patients who ask about. Um, it's one that I'm not from, was not familiar with at all till patients started asking. Uh, it is the so it's pronounced berberine, and it is a plant extract that comes from different plants. Um, I've seen golden seal before as I've gone through the aisle of the supplement aisle at the store. Uh, it is used in Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine for more than 2,500 years. So it's not new to some people. It was new to me, but it's not new to some people. And uh, as I say all the time, always discuss these supplements with your doctor. Uh, anytime you're thinking of trying one, or if you're already taking a supplement, I definitely, I strongly advise you to uh, share that information with your doctor. Don't keep that secret because there are times when they can have an an effect on other medication you're taking. But um, berberine, just, um, it, the research that I looked at, there was a dose of 0 0.9 to 1.5 grams daily. Again, another meta-analysis, so that's a good thing, showed that it may decrease postprandial glucose by 15 to 30 milligrams per deciliter and A1C by 0 0.7 when compared to lifestyle and then interventions alone. Uh, so, Let's look at some of those words. Meta-analysis, we already know that's a good thing. It's a, it's a decent, you know, it's a way of looking at a bunch of research. And so we're getting a lot of information so we can hopefully make a better or a more, you know, thorough uh, decision on, is this a good idea? Um, it decreased postprandial glucose. Postprandial is just your after your meal um, glucose, which most of the time after we eat is when our blood sugar does go up. Um, let's see, by 15 to 34 points. So that's not too bad. An A1C of 0 0.7, and I can tell you that, or a decrease in A1C by 0 0.7, I can tell you a lot of the diabetic medications out there don't offer a whole lot more uh, improvement in A1C than a 0 0.7, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes, well, for instance, diabetic education alone can change your uh, blood sugar research has found that it can help um, your A1C 0 point, or can change your A1C 0.6%. So, I mean, just diabetic education alone could make that change. And a lot of the medications out there don't give a whole lot more than the 0 0.7. So that doesn't sound too bad. Uh, how might this berberine work? It decreases insulin resistance. So the same thing we just talked about in cinnamon and that it makes your cells more uh, accepting of insulin, increases the breakdown of glucose inside the cell and decreases glucose production in the liver and increases beneficial bacteria in the gut. So kind of a bunch of things going on there, but a lot of things we talk about anyway. We talk, I do, at least when I talk with my patients, we talk a lot about controlling the liver because the liver, when you don't eat, uh, your liver and other muscle cells, but the liver especially holds on to glucose. And when you don't eat, it lets go of that glucose. And so a lot of times when people come to me and they're like, I, don't, I didn't eat at all and my blood sugar was high, you know, we talk about that, that 
it is your body's goal to keep you alive. And if it recognizes or senses that your blood sugar is going low or even getting close to going low, it will, the liver will spill out some glucose. Sometimes it spills out too much. It overdoes. Uh, and in that case, the pancreas might overreact. Um, and then sometimes the liver takes its time. So maybe like before lunch, like now I haven't eaten. If I start having low blood sugar symptoms and my liver doesn't react, I could have those symptoms. I could go ahead and be you know, nauseous or weak or sweaty or you know blurry vision or whatever, because the liver didn't get busy and re react fast enough. Uh, so again, that liver, I always tell everybody sometimes seems to have a mind of its own where it either overreacts or sometimes underreacts. <laughs> so we can't really control the liver. It reacts um, to blood sugar. Uh, and so that's when it, when it's going low, it decides what it wants to do. So, um, but that's interesting that berberine can help um, kind of pay attention. It can make the liver kind of control itself, decreases the, its ability to, to spill out that blood sugar. Uh, all right. So again, as always, I'm always going to say this uh, throughout the whole uh, presentation, discuss with your doctor any anytime you want to start berberine or any supplement. Um, so how might it work from what they're what the research shows? They think that it activates a metabolism regulating enzyme um, that normalizes um, lipids um, or fats that you have in your blood, um, normalizes glucose and normalizes energy imbalances. Uh, they were unsure about a recommended dose. The study that um, we, I looked at and put in here was um, they gave 0 0.9 to 1.5 grams daily. Other sources, though, had 500 milligrams three times a day. Uh, I think it's a good question to ask your doctor if you're taking this to just verify with them what they think would be a, a good dose. Um, potential side effects. It changes um, the way other medications that you take might work, especially they suggest they mentioned antibiotics and blood pressure medications. Uh, there's a risk of bleeding. Um, it has an antiplatelet effect and uh, it's dangerous for pregnancy. So um, if you're pregnant or thinking of becoming pregnant, do not definitely stop berberine. Um, and it's dangerous if you're on blood thinners, even aspirin, they said. So a lot of people I know take oh, their daily you know, aspirin uh, to help thin blood and, and whether the doctors uh, suggested it or if someone just does the, you know, the small dose, low dose aspirin, but even aspirin being a, th a blood thinner, this can be an additive effect where it even thins the blood even more. And I put at the bottom all the different bottles and there were many more bottles of berberine uh, and you can see all the different doses, 500 milligrams, you know, some of them have 1200, 4,700 4, milligrams. I'm like, what? You know, it's a big difference, you know, berberine times five. And so when you look at all of these bottles, you're like, which one's right? What should I be doing? What's, which one's safe? You know? And so I think that's the hard part is there's so many, um, companies, people out there who are trying to sell a product. And if there's a benefit, yeah, we're all for it. We, we want you to be healthy. We want blood sugar well controlled, but we mainly want you to be safe. And I think sometimes as I looked at all these bottles, and like I said, this is just a few of all of them that are out there. Um, it's to me very confusing as to which one is the right choice. So looking at berberine critically, uh, there was a meta-analysis check, not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, Postprandial check, it really, it supposedly reduced blood sugar uh, quite a bit after postprandial, after your meal. That's when we want medication to work um, because that's usually when our blood sugar goes up after we eat. So that's another check. It decreased A1C 0.7. That may not sound like a lot to you, but it actually is to me compared to a lot of diabetic medications out there. Uh, and what they say that A1C will drop if you take their medication. So I thought that was a good thing too. Um, but the thing that caught my eye was they did this study compared to lifestyle changes alone, not to other diabetic medications or even other supplements. So I think that's a, a thing too. It's like, what are they comparing uh, taking this supplement to? And how did it show so much more than what just life change, lifestyle changes did? Uh, again, the big thing, avoid if pregnant, it could cause fetal brain damage, they said, or premature con contractions. There's an increased risk of bleeding. It has the antiplatelet properties we talked about. 
Um, and it can affect other medications that you take, whether it gets in the way of those medications being metabolized correct, you know, correctly or being metabolized at all, whether they um, don't hang out in your system long enough to do their job um, or they hang or this berberine causes them to not metabolize right. So they hang out longer in your system and they can build up. Uh, that's the true, that's what we went through or I'll find in other uh, supplements also is, is what they say. Uh, it definitely can affect the metabolism of other medications, which can, can, depending on how serious and needed that medication is, it can lead to some pretty serious complications. Okay. Just to... All right. So we've been through two of them, uh, supplements so far. We still don't have any definite answer that, yes, this is a good thing or not a good thing to take. So we're going to just keep plugging along. I think we'll find that with each one of these. It's it's still up in the air. Um, but chromium is one that I have a lot of people ask about also. Um, probably second in line is chromium. Uh, first is cinnamon. Um, it's a trace element. There's a debate evidently or has been a debate going on. Is it essential or not essential? But it is a trace element in your body. It helps break down fats. Um, proteins and carbohydrates, and it stimulates fatty acids and cholesterol synthesis, which are very important for the brain um, and other body functions. Um, chromium levels can be checked. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, cinnamon, I don't believe we have a lab to check how much cinnamon you have in your body. Uh, same thing with berberine. I don't believe there's a lab for that. If, if there is and someone knows, please let me know. I know there are ways sometimes um, by chelating in different ways that you can actually get certain things out and maybe measure for them. Um, so if you do, let please put a message in and let us know. Um, but chromium levels can be checked with blood, you know, uh, they do, you know, they check, uh, check your regular, you know, CMP and, and, and A1C and all the labs they do, they can add chromium check. Um, they can also check it in urine, sweat, and even your hair. So there's a way of checking your level of chromium to see if you have enough or if you have too much. So to me, that's, to me, that also makes me feel a little better. So we have a little objective level there going on. No, oh, I think I skipped ahead. So, uh, Thinking critically about chromium, there are 30 years of study, so that's a long time to be studying something. It suggests it may help control blood sugar by increasing insulin sensitivity, which is what we've been talking about, um, making those cells more sensitive to insulin and lowering glucose up to 0 0.6 and um, fasting blood sugar up to, um, that probably is A1C, sorry, A1C up to 0.6% and then fasting blood sugar up to 18%. Um, however, what they found is if you don't have a deficiency, studies are showing that there really is little benefit. Um, in one study, they gave 400 micrograms daily for six months, but it did not improve blood sugar and control or blood sugar control in 400 people with type 2 diabetes. However, there are studies in China and India that have found there's improvement, but most of that improvement and benefit was found in people who have poor nutrition. I don't know. Maybe here in the United States, we have poor nutrition. I think that's something, again, you'd have to ask yourself, think critically, are you eating healthy? Because that's one of the things that um, specifically with chromium um, that I'll show you that they're talking, let's try and get it in the food that you're going to eat. So what they found, um, what some research has found is a low dose won't harm, but a high dose could. If you're taking a multivitamin already and eating a healthy diet of whole grains, I put broccoli and other vegetables, but green leafy vegetables, you can really get all the chromium that you really need. Too much chromium, high levels can damage kidneys and liver and cause mood disturbances. It can also interfere with the medications such as the antacids that you might take. And some of those are called H2 blockers, protein pump inhibitors. Um, I'm thinking of things like Nexium, um, um, Omeprazole, different ones like that. It can also get in the way of beta blockers, which are uh, blood pressure medicines, um, corticosteroids, and um, non-steroidal uh, non anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen. So um, again, maybe a little bit of help, but they're really focusing on the things that I read about where let's try to get this through the food that you're going to eat and not take a necessarily a supplement for it. And if that's the case, they're saying it's possibly safe, 
the amount you might take as a dose, 200 to 1,000 micrograms. Again, notice the micrograms, different than milligrams in some measurements. Caution if you have kidney or liver issues or disease of any sort, and really try to get it from the foods that you eat. Um, this picture is just some of the, the foods that um, chromium would be in. So one thing I was talking to one of the care coordinators about last week was every time we talk to a patient, every time we talk about anything and go, you know, we're we can go on and on about medication and supplements and, and whatever. It really gets back to your diet. And so we talk a lot about the my plate and I'm looking at that picture and I'm seeing the my plate. Uh, I might be missing, you know, a specific piece of meat to hit the protein area, but you can get protein through some of the vegetables there and the nuts. So um, really, if you're thinking about the my, you start looking at the my plate and using that and actually trying to focus on getting a healthy diet, we actually might have less worries about taking uh, supplements. Uh, but there at least is a way of checking your chromium level. And so to me, that even makes it feel makes me feel a little safer and that there's an objective methods for first, get a chromium level before you even start taking it, you know, have your doctor check your chromium levels. And then if you're low, then work with your doctor to consider what a dose would be, or then look at your diet and see when you can actually add more foods that have chromium in them. Fin Greek is a um, supplement um, that I heard about a long time ago from a friend who was taking it. And again, something I had did not have a lot of experience in, um, but she felt very confident taking it. Uh, it is an ancient medicinal herb. Uh, I thought it was kind of interesting that it smells and tastes like maple syrup. That's a good thing, I think. Um, there are several small studies that suggest it may help reduce blood sugar. So let's see what else we can find about fenugreek. What they found is it may decrease fasting and postprandial by 15 to 23 respectively. So that's pretty good, fasting by 15 and, and after meals by around 23. It can decrease A1C by 1.16%. And again, that's a meta-analysis, but only of 10 studies. So they took 10 studies, they compared them, looked at them to, to see what overall they all found. Um, however, there was no uniform dose in all 10 studies. So that to me is a red flag. Uh, to me, that makes it a little harder to say, okay, well, then this is definitely something that can be relied on. If everyone was a little bit different dose, we're still up in the air of like, what is the safe dose? Uh, it can be taken or it is taken with powder, seeds, capsules, and different methods of herbal processing. Um, possibly safe when only used up to six months is one of the things they said. And I thought, okay, then what do you, what's a person do after six months? I mean, you're looking for an answer to help your blood sugar be better controlled, not just for six months, but you know, forever for your, for your whole life. So taking it only for six months might've worked for the study, but it doesn't work for uh, everybody out in the real world. And then another thing that I think a lot of times, um, they always put is avoid if you're pregnant because they just don't know for sure the safety. So how might fenugreek work? Um, it is rich in fiber and um, compounds called saponins. Uh, so it seems to slow down carbohydrate um, absorption after a meal and improve insulin sensitivity. This sounds, and all of them actually sound a lot like some of the medications that we have out there that are prescribed um, from what, how they work. Um, the recommended dose that's available as a tea and in capsule form and typically is five to 100 grams per day. There are potential side effects, um, a lot of GI side effects, um, gas, bloating, diarrhea, and a death, another one that might interfere with blood thinning drugs, uh, such as warfarin and Coumadin. And I would go ahead and add the other ones in there too, you know, so that you don't just think it's just warfarin, but any blood thinner um, could possibly have an interaction with. So let's think, look at this fenugreek uh, critically. So check, there was improvement of blood sugar fasting and after meals. Um, along with an improvement in A1C. That all sounds great. However, the different doses and different formulations weren't uniform in all those studies, so it makes it hard to bring together a complete, you know, get a definite answer of which form should I take uh, and how much, what's the correct dose. Um, that limited use to six months, like I said before, then what? 
uh, it's not safe for anyone who's pregnant or become planning on becoming pregnant and it's not for safe for anybody who's on blood thinners so again using thinking all this putting it all together you have to really weigh the options is it really even though there's improvement in the blood sugars is it safe for you um, and that again when I would say definitely have that conversation with your doctor so vitamin D um, another one of the supplements that can be measured in a lab and so I would suggest I strongly suggest if you've never had your vitamin D level checked to do that ask your doctor at your next visit and get a vitamin D level um, you know we Vitamin D we can get from just being in the sunshine 10 to 15 minutes a day or three to five days a week, not even every single day. Uh, Dr. Rico, uh, you know, the endocrinologist I work with who was on our last month's um, presentation, he, he says he thinks everybody in Indiana is low in vitamin D. Uh, well, if that's the case, even though we have sunshine, are we not getting it out enough into the sunshine? Are we not spending enough time outside? You know, what's going on that our vitamin D levels are low? Um, so um, usually the level of a vitamin D lab would be like, the, the number would be 30 to 100, I think is what the, the high end of it is. Um, so have that lab done and have your, have your doctor check to see where you're at on that, on that 30 to 100. Um, you can get vitamin D also through vitamin D rich foods and also there's, uh, supplements. So again, some research that was done. Um, healthy people who took vitamin, who took uh, 500 international units of vitamin D um, or more of vitamin D um, were 13 per less 13 percent less likely to develop type 2 diabetes than those getting less than 200 international units. So that right there is an indication that maybe we need to be looking at vitamin D levels earlier than waiting until you know someone has diabetes. Let's look at them prior to someone being diagnosed diabetes, like diabetic. Again, anybody you know, someone who you know doesn't have diabetes, you know, I suggest to them, hey, have you had your vitamin D level checked before? Have the doctor do it. It's an interesting thing to know. Is it low? And the thing is, once you take a supplement, since there's a, a lab, you can redo the lab and see if it's improved. Um, vitamin D plus calcium could help support. Another thing that they found is vitamin D plus calcium could help support better blood sugar control. Low vitamin D has been associated with poor glycemic control in some early research, but they don't know yet if it's taking, if taking it really helps control blood sugar or how it may work. Um, the National Center for Health Statistics estimates that one in three Americans don't get enough vitamin D. Uh, I know, uh, and I may have written this on another slide somewhere, but I do know during COVID, one of the things they found that not only people who had a vitamin D deficiency, but those who were below 50. So think of that range 30 to 100. If you were below 50, you were more likely um, to land in the ICU with COVID where, that, I mean, that's what they were finding. That was one of the many things that they were finding because they're trying to figure out, okay, who's more susceptible? Who's going to get sicker? What do we need to look at? What can we do to fix it? And so at the very end of this list of the low vitamin D symptoms uh, is you get sick more easily. Uh, you, you may be fatigued, uh, not sleep well, have bone pain, depression, feeling of sadness, mood changes, hair loss, muscle weakness and cramps, loss of appetite, um, all of these and, and probably more, these were just some that I ran across, symptoms if you have low vitamin D. So a lot of times you can be feeling pretty bad and it's literally just a low vitamin D level. Uh, so I definitely strongly suggest everybody to get checked. And if you're taking vitamin D of any sort, have, get rechecked then to see if it's improving and not only improving that you're at, you know, in that range of 30 to 100, you know, not that you're at 31. So you're within the range, but see if your doctor is willing to work with you to get you at 50 or a little bit above so that you're even better covered from what they found with COVID uh, during COVID um, pandemic. So some of you who are already knowledgeable about vitamin D may already know that there are two forms. Um, there's D2 and there's D3. D2 comes from plants and D3 comes from animal products. Um, our body more easily absorbs D3 than D2. Um, but oftentimes our doctors, when they prescribe vitamin D, so it can be prescribed uh, and it can also be purchased over the counter. 
uh, but the prescription is for D2. And uh, a D2 is given in higher doses. Sometimes if you've ever taken uh, vitamin D2, sometimes at least on our end, we see like 50,000 uh, international units a week. So it's once a week, only for a short amount of time. And then they get another vitamin D level to see or lab to see if it's gone up, see if there's been any change to see if they can back off or if they need to increase or continue on that for a little bit longer. But that D2 is in higher doses, it's short term, and um, they prefer vitamin D2. If you have chronic kidney disease, they prefer you to take vitamin D2 compared to the D3. Um, D2 is also preferred if you have calcium or and or parathyroid disorders, they would rather you take D2. Um, but my, most of the time, Dr. Rico, when we have a patient um, who sees him, um, who is low in vitamin D, he just suggests a D3 over the counter any D3. He doesn't have a specific one, but he just suggests one over the counter. So there are two different forms and some people ask questions about that. Uh, there's reasons why a doctor would prescribe D2 and there's other reasons why they might suggest you just go to the uh, pharmacy closest to you and get a D3 over the counter. I think the thing always though is get that lab, that follow-up lab. I find a lot of times patients don't follow up and get that follow-up lab. So they never know, was there a benefit? You're taking this supplement, but we don't even know if there's a benefit. So the way they think vitamin D works, um, it seems to improve insulin sensitivity again, but no one's for sure of its mechanism of action. Uh, the recommended dose is 600 international units up to age 70 and then 800 un international units uh, after age 70. The National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends up to 800 international units um, until age 50 and then increase to 1,000 after age 50. But really what they found is that up to 4,000 inter international units is even considered safe. So really that again is a conversation between you and your doctor and those labs can tell you a whole lot of do we need to keep increasing your vitamin D. There are potential side effects. Um, high doses for a long time can cause weight loss, heart rhythm problems, damage to the um, damage to the heart, sorry, uh, and blood vessels and kidneys. So um, that's why it's so important again to um, follow up with that lab. Okay, so I'm missing my... All right, I think I missed a... Yep, I missed a slide. So along with uh, all the other supplements that I looked over, they really do try to return you to eating a healthier diet and get this supplement through the food that you eat. Uh, and so these are just some of the foods that are high in vitamin D. I'm sure there's a whole lot more, but there are also foods that are fortified that with vitamin D. So like milk, certain cereals, orange juice. So you can get those in um, just the diet that you choose. And looking at that picture off to the right there, again, I'm thinking of the my plate and it is everything we talk about when we're talking about a healthy diet and fitting that healthy diet onto that my plate. And we've talked about that many times. And I'm sure you all probably have a handout of my plate. So again, have that lab, have it repeated, have it done periodically. I don't know, every six, every, every six months, every year to check and see what your levels are, making sure they're staying up where they need to be uh, and they're not too high. So since there's a lab, it can feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, another, um, I'm going to call it a supplement, but clearly it's a plant, but, um, a fruit, I guess, uh, that I have never heard of, um, until I went to a conference a few years ago and they were talking about this, that a lot of their patients were wanting to take it, uh, is bitter melon. Uh, it is a fruit of a tropical plant and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Um, uh, it is in the cucumber family and you can have told that by the looks of it. It looks a lot like a cucumber, but it's called bitter melon. And, it's widely used in Africa, Asia, India, and South America. It's sold there in different forms. Uh, and it, you know, there's, there's, it's juice, there's, uh, of course, dry, there's concentrated. So it's sold in all kinds of different forms, they said. But it helps maintain healthy blood sugar levels. The um, National Institute of Health and the National Center for Complement complementary and alternative medicine said there's limited research supporting the claim that it can help maintain healthy blood sugars. 
So there's conflicting research. There was a meta-analysis that showed one to six grams daily for four to 12 weeks did not make improvement in A1C or blood sugar compared to a placebo. But there was also a compound within the bitter melon called K16 that did show some benefit. So what their conclusion was, we need more research. <laughs> Again, they say that a lot. Sometimes I'm glad when they say that uh, we need more research. I think that's great because they're always like, keep questioning, you know, keep, keep looking for a better answer. And But then it's frustrating because you're wanting an answer and they'll say, we need to do more research or more research is needed. So, um, so anyway, the bitter melon in and of itself, maybe not the answer, but possibly a compound within the bitter melon might, might be an answer. Um, but again, it's their people in these other countries are, they're drinking it as a juice. They're adding it. Oh, they cook with it. They use it in meals and they're, I mean, in the recipes. And, um, then of course it's sold in capsule form also. Uh, they think it, the, again, the compounds within the bitter melon activate an enzyme that encourages muscles to take up blood sugar and also blocks the intestines from absorbing glucose um, and controls the liver. So I highlighted all of those things that it does to help with blood sugar. And again, they remind me a lot of medications like metformin that, that helps you know, make your blood sugar or makes your, um, controls the liver to some extent. And it makes all of your cells more receptive to insulin. Um, and then like GLP-1s that work in the intestines and the gut to help blood sugar be well controlled. Uh, recommended dose used as a vegetable. I'm sorry, it's not a vegetable, it's a fruit. Um, a juice, tea, or taken in capsule. That was a question though that some of them had. Is it a vegetable or a fruit? I found that it was a fruit. Uh, if you guys know something different, let me know. Uh, typically the dose is 50 to 100 milliliters or three to six tablespoons per day. Uh, potential side effects may cause GI distress um, and allergic reactions in people allergic to melons. That makes sense. So overall, not a whole lot of answers to that um, for bitter melon. Um, it seems like if other people are eating it in their food, that might be the better way of getting it is actually working it into your diet uh, and um, talking to your doctor about it if you're wanting to actually take it any other form besides working it into your diet. Magnesium is another um, essential element that we need in our body. Uh, again, it's always um, full of the foods that we have choices of are full of magnesium also. Uh, they're going to suggest that you try to get it, your magnesium through the food that you eat. It's an essential mineral for the body. Magnesium is involved in 300 chemical reactions. It's the muscles need it to contract. The nerves need it to send and receive messages. It helps keep your heart beating steady and it helps keep your, your immune system strong. So it's a very, again, essential mineral for the body. And what they have found um, in some studies is that one in four patients with diabetes may have low levels of magnesium. Um, the, NI, the National Institute of Health Office of Dietary Supplements found that diabetes may increase magnesium requirements for two reasons, uh, poorly controlled blood sugar and use of blood pressure lowering diuretic medications. So those two things, of course, with someone who has diabetes may actually mean that you need some magnesium. In one study, people with type 2 um, diabetes and low magnesium levels um, who took oral magnesium um, chloride daily for 16 weeks saw improvements in their A1Cs, but in other research, no benefit was found. Uh, I think um, a red flag here to me was all it said was they saw improvement in their A1C, but they didn't give me any specifics. I, I like the specifics. I don't know if you're, you're, if you're the kind of person like any improvement's good, I'll take it. Uh, then maybe that wasn't a red flag, but for me, it's a red flag. Um, and then also the other red flag is that this is only one study. It was not a meta-analysis. Um, and then it also says in other research, no benefit was, was found. So how magnesium may work, uh, it plays a role in the transport of glucose into the cells. So it may improve insulin sensitivity. They have recommended doses there for men and women, depending on your age. Um, they also said that a multivitamin plus several whole grains and green vegetable, green leafy vegetables 
can may supply all the magnesium that you actually need. Uh, so if you're taking a multivitamin, plus you're really trying to eat a healthy meal three times a day, you're probably getting all the magnesium that you need. Um, there are some side effects of high dosing. Uh, you can have diarrhea, cramping, muscle weakness, breathing problems, and a low heart rate. Uh, as always, they suggest that it's best to try and get it from your diet. These are a few of the magnesium rich foods. And if you look at this, it's not a whole lot of food to get some magnesium. So if you're taking a multivitamin that has magnesium in it and you eat one ounce, which is very little of dry roasted almonds or a half a cup of cooked spinach or some kidney beans in your chili that you're going to make probably soon as the weather's changed and cooling off, or you eat bran flakes for breakfast or whatever as a snack, you're going to get some magnesium. So think about trying to, again, work on that healthy diet. And if you're taking your, um, your regular old vitamin, it's probably got magnesium in it. Plus some of this can actually get the amount that you need. Um, and then another thing I didn't put here, I believe, is that we can measure magnesium also. We can get a measurement of that also. Um, so that we know if you have enough, need more and so on. So whether it's a lab or like I said, the chelating that my doctor talks a lot about chelating. So um, there are um, ways of, of measuring that and checking it. So again, that makes me feel kind of safe. Anytime we can do a lab or we can do some kind of objective measurement to see, am I got too much? Do I not have enough? What do I need to do as far as increase a, a supp supplement or quit taking one? That's always beneficial because Many of these supplements are reported to work by making muscles take up um, sugar to control or to control the liver. Um, and because like I said earlier, the liver can, can release too much blood sugar and then blood sugar can be high. Uh, so like I said earlier, this sounds a lot like the diabetic medications that are prescribed. That to me makes me start questioning both ways. Like, why don't we just take diabetic medications instead of doing a supplement? But then it also makes me question, wait a minute, the supplements probably for some of these uh, supplements, fruits, uh, you know, uh, spices and all this came before the medication. So did these, the, the drug medic, the pharmaco um, pharmaceutical manufacturers realize, oh, these, these supplements do this, let's make a drug off of it. And I'm sure, because that's what we know happens a lot. And, and then, of course, at that time, then are they saying then the supplements aren't safe or are they safe? Again, to me, it's frustrating because we've gone through the presentation and still I'm not sure. Can we really say that they're safe um, or not safe? Um, but the, this is just a list of a few that the FDA has sent warning letters to the companies because they did identify them as illegally selling dietary supplements and products. So, you know, to me, it's just things like this that really are red flags. Um, I don't know if any of these sound familiar to you. The name of the company, sorry, I didn't put that at the top, but the name of the company is off to the left and then to the right is the name of the supplement um, or diabetic support medication that they were suggesting you take. So I just put that on there as a, as a reference and just mainly to keep your eyes open and your mind open. I think the, the one thing that they all agreed on was we need more research. So again, like I said earlier, that can be frustrating, but it's also encouraging that we are continuing to ask questions. Um, and that is the best thing is always asking questions and looking for the most information you can get. Uh, words like that were used a lot, it seemed like uh, in, in the articles I read were possibly, maybe, likely. I'm like, this is getting frustrating because again, no definite answer. Um, I think the next slide is the, oh, nope, I got one more. So what should you do if you want to take a supplement? Because some people like them. They think of them as being more natural and they just would rather take a supplement. And I'm guilty of that too. I mean, I have supplements. And most of the ones I take are the ones my doctor can, can um, check with a level, a blood lab um, or any other kind of level that she wants to do so that we have a better idea of what I am, what is actually going around in my body and what more do I need or less. But always, always, always talk to your doctor and let them know what supplement, supplements you are taking uh, because of the possibility of ever contra, you know, getting in the way of the metabolism of any other medication uh, that you're taking, whether it be that it doesn't allow that medicine to work the way it should because it blocks whatever, um, or it causes that medicine to not be metabolized. And so then that medicine builds up in your system and causes dangerous levels. So 
Um, we, you know, a lot of the things with the supplements notice that they can affect other medications that you might be taking. So definitely let your doctor know about those supplements. If there's a lab that can be done um, to check for deficiency, always make sure to be before starting. And then I didn't finish my sentence, I see, but, and then during, um, whether it's every six months or every year, uh, whatever you and your doctor decide on, get another lab to see, is that supplement you're taking working? Is it working too well uh, or not well enough? So you need to take a little more or a little less. Um, choose a standardized high quality product. So it's going to have a um, the standardized high quality product will have a set amount of active ingredients in every dose. And it'll tell you that on the, the back, look at the label on the back of the supplement. The label should also have um, the USP or the um, US Pharmacopia or consumerlab.com um, seal. It means that the product at least is meeting standards for strength and purity. And then always ask yourself why you're interested in supplements. Are you looking for an easy way to control blood sugar? Um, Cause I'll have patients who are unwilling to take their diabetic medication, but they're willing to do supplements. And it's kind of like, uh, I don't, you know, we got to find a balance. I think sometimes, um, are you trying to reduce the cost of medication? I mean, that's a big thing. Sometimes we think we can just get a supplement over the counter and we can actually not have to pay for the prescription that was sent in. So uh, if you're having trouble with cost of medication, again, another thing to talk to your doctor about, see if we could do something different or if they're willing to work with you on taking supplements instead. Uh, are you trying to avoid other diabetic medications? I've got patients who refuse, refuse, refuse. They don't wanna take insulin. So they'll do anything in the world to avoid taking insulin. Um, so and, and insulin is the one thing that we all have naturally in our body. <laughs> So it's kind of like, it's the one natural thing. It's the one thing that can actually fix blood sugar, but we, they try to avoid it. And if that's the case, talk to someone about what it is about insulin or what it is about any other medication, you know, that you just don't want to take. That's the problem and see if we can come to, you know, maybe there's just some information that would be helpful that would make you understand, or maybe you'd still stick to your guns and say, no, I, I just will take the supplements. Um, or are you being swayed? Are you interested in supplements because you're being swayed by the latest commercial or website or 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 uh, YouTube video or you know whatever it says on Facebook? So to me, those are the big red flags because you know that those companies are trying to get your business. They're more interested in your business, you know, of getting you to buy their product than they are in your safety. So always, always question those for sure. Oh, this is the one I thought I was, this was the next slide. So this is one of the last slides, but this is the one that um, hopefully Haley will get on to um, attached with the presentation so that I don't know. I thought this was pretty good now. So this all of this information came from the Cleveland Clinic, um, which is a, a, a pretty good source. I use them often when it's diabetic education, but um, the, the uh, diabetic diabetes education services took all of the information from the uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, Wellness um, Review, and they put it together in this pretty cool form so that you can see, you know, the green, if there's a little green box next to the uh, supplement um, or um, type of spice or whatever you're wanting to add to your diet, um, is it tells you it's recommended. Several well-designed studies in humans have shown positive benefit. Their team, again, that's Cleveland Clinic team, who reviewed all of these uh, are confident about its therapeutic potential. Uh, the orange recommended, but with caution, preliminary studies suggest some benefit. Future trials are needed before we can make a stronger recommendation. The ones with the blue next to them, not recommended evidence, um, not recommended evidence. Our team does not recommend this product because clinical trials to date suggest little to no benefit. And then the red, not recommended high risk. Our team recommends against these products because clinical trials suggest substantial risk greater than the benefit. And I look down there. Okay, so you know the far uh, left side is to is for cholesterol, um, and then the middle is for diabetes. But I look down there and I see the red bitter melon, and I think about what I read and the little research that I did, and then I see this. So. Again, I think putting it all together can kind of get frustrating. Um, I wish that we could have went through all of these, plus I'm sure there's more. These are just a few. Um, and I wish we could have went through more, but the time constraints, there's just so much. Um, I think the, you know, if you think about it, I think the best and safest thing to do is uh, take a list like this, take your supplements that you're taking, 
circle, I would circle them. You know, that's what I actually did on my uh, sheet that I was going to use. I circled chromium and it's in the it's in the orange. So recommended with caution. Uh, I circled cinnamon, recommended with caution. Uh, I circled bitter melon, avoid, <laughs> it's in the red. <laughs> Um, over on the uh, cholesterol, the vitamin D there, uh, it's for at least for cholesterol, it says recommended with caution. Um, so I just magnesium in the blue, not necessarily recommended. Um, so take a, a source like this, take some knowledge that you already have and talk to your healthcare provider, whether it's a doctor, your nurse practitioner, that is the first best step and get a lab if possible and have them look over all of your medication lists and discuss which one of the supplements one of the that you want to start one of the things they suggested is you start with one like you don't want to start with like two or six or whatever supplements because we won't know which one maybe if it's affecting something we won't know which one so start with one you know and add that and give it some time months to see how it's doing um, but again, always talking to your doctor to determine where to start and what to do. So um, looks like there might be a question or two. Uh, so it looks like um, Haley already put the supplement safety that we just went over. So that's up there for you as a reference, if that's something you'd like to look into. Um, so Jan is saying that vitamin D supplements as well as others absorb differently depending on how your gut health is. That's true. Um, so many supplements on the market often need to have a specialty pharmacy identifying option and brand. That's true. So yeah, for sure. Uh, medical doctors and most pharmacists are not extensively trained and I will agree on that. Um, uh, so take your knowledge. I, I, the reason I even say talk to your healthcare provider is because I'm hoping that they'll be willing to work with you on starting a supplement if that's something you're interested in. I, and I may be thinking that because that's what my nurse practitioner does. I go to a nurse practitioner that's not part of Valley Professionals, but I have gone to her for like 20 years. So I continue to go to her and she's very knowledgeable on many of the supplements. Some that she suggests I don't take um, and some that she does suggest um, that have labs with them, then I take and we clearly monitor the labs. So um, yeah, find your uh, doctor who's willing to at least have that discussion with you. And I will agree that a lot of, it seems like to me, a lot of medical doctors are want to steer away from uh, herbs and supplements and things they're not real familiar with. So come with some of your knowledge and be willing to have a conversation with them. Um, and realize that they are too looking out for your safety while you're working on your end of being healthy and staying safe also. Uh, I think the first place to start is simply look at your diet also, because that's one of the main things they all went back to in all this research is try to get these supplements through the food that you eat. Start looking at your diet. Make sure you're getting all of those foods, those green leafy vegetables, the good proteins. You know, we've talked about them over and over using the my plate. Uh, is a first place to start even. Um, and then, like I said, if you're going to add these in, or if you already are, talk to your doctor and you see if there's a lab available so that we can check and see what your levels are. If you're going to start something, talk to them and only do one at a time so that you can keep an eye on symptoms and, and, and any contraindications that might occur. So... All right, guys. Well, I hope that it wasn't more frustrating because, again, I feel like we haven't found any definitive answer. And that's what I'm always looking for. I think that's a good thing to not always get a definitive answer. It causes you to keep questioning and keep researching. At the other time, sometimes it can be frustrating because sometimes you just want that answer. Uh, so uh, I hope it wasn't too um, frustrating and overwhelming, but just some basic information on supplement safety when you have diabetes and does it really help blood sugar as you take these supplements um, is what I was hoping to cover today. And it was a very small amount compared to all the supplements that are out there. So, hey, Joel, right. like, yeah, it looks ahead. like we have a question in the chat. Yeah, the best source for psyllium. I didn't look that one up, but that one, if anybody else has uh, an answer to that, please um, let us know. But I'm thinking that actually is in some of the, um, the like Metamucil and some of the fiber um, things that you can add to your drinks and, and drink that. Or I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw that even in a, in a capsule form. 
Um, but that one I did not do any research on. So I do know that that's fiber. I'm going to add a lot of fiber to your body. And so um, that to me is, I start thinking about foods that are full of fiber. Like if we just talk about fruits, for instance, um, an apple has more fiber than a watermelon. So fiber for the, the apple is going to have less effect on your blood sugar. That fiber that's in that apple that the watermelon seems to lack doesn't have as much fiber. That fiber helps blood sugar stay controlled. It helps keep it from spiking. So you, you might eat a piece of fruit and blood sugar will, you know, will go up. If it's got a lot of fiber, it'll go up, but it won't spike as far as it would if you ate like a candy bar or a piece of watermelon that doesn't have any fiber in it. So that's why I think they put psyllium there is because of all, it's going to have that fiber in it that's going to help um, as you're digesting food, going to help control blood sugar and not allow it to spike. Um, the problem with when you have diabetes and blood sugar spikes, you know, it spikes up to 300 and it stays high. It takes it a long time to come back down. That's why we're trying to avoid blood sugar spikes because it takes so long for them to come back down uh, to the 80 to 140 range or well-controlled range, whatever you're, you're shooting for. Um, and what your doctor has decided is a good uh, range for you. Dr. Rico usually says 80 to 140 is our goal. Uh, so, um, but I don't know the best source. I'm sorry. I don't know that because I didn't do research on that one. Um, if anybody else has any like suggestions or any information on psyllium, let me know, or just go ahead and send something through the message board. All right. So in October, I think we're actually going to be meeting on, um, the 31st, I think is the actual day. Uh, and like I said, in October, the, um, yep, the 31st, the presentation is going to be again about uh, going to the store and creating some menus, some recipes that are hopefully affordable and are definitely going to be healthy for you and easy to make. That's I'm all about ease and, and affordability. Uh, and with the holidays coming around, I'm going to be focusing more on like pumpkin recipes and things that kind of lend, lend themselves towards the fall soups that we start looking for uh, in this in the winter months, some warm food. So if you're able to come back on the 31st, we will have those um, recipes and kind of go over them looking at carbohydrates and looking at how they fit into the my plate. Um, are they healthy choices and um, how they can actually hopefully fill that spot of uh, making a healthy choice over the times with the holidays coming where it's going to be, you know, pumpkin pie is going to be calling our name, but hopefully I have a pumpkin recipe that's hopefully a little bit, a little bit healthier, maybe. So, all right. Well, there's no comments. I'm sorry. We didn't have a definite, we didn't have a definite answer for anything, but I'm sorry. We didn't have a definite answer for the question about psyllium, but um, maybe we can see what we can get for you for the next time. And if you have a chance, do your research and share it with us next time. I really would appreciate that. All right. Oh, wait, wait, there is a chat. <laughs> So someone says they use a fiber product called Just Better. You can order it online. There's no grit, no color, no taste. You mix it in warm, cold drinks or food. Hey, that's a good idea. So yeah, um, that some of that fiber stuff that I just remember my grandparents mixing into a glass of water looked pretty nasty. So yeah, no grit, no color, no taste. That would be perfect because you'd get the benefit of it without having to like go through all the horrible taste or uh, grit of it. Yeah, and even mixing it with some food. Okay, it's a corn fiber said um, it works real well. Evidently, she loves it. Great, thank you, Michelle, for sharing. All right, well, we are going to close out because it is a little after it's one fourteen. Um, so we'll close out today, and I look forward to seeing you guys all on the thirty first.